the reason we have a gravel garden is because we've got heavy clay soil. And a lot of my favorite plants are borderline hardy, Mediterranean style plants, which hate clay. So we decided to make a gravel garden. Nobody had done this. This is 27 years ago. Beth Chateau was making her gravel garden and she uses gravel as a mulch on the surface. Well, I knew mulching my heavy clay with gravel was gonna be a disaster. We would just have weed heaven and the plants wouldn't like it. I decided we were gonna have a really deep gravel garden. This is eight inches of gravel on sticky yellow clay. The plants have loved it. And welcome to episode 93 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Rustinol Vicarage, actually looking a bit subdued. Are you wearing beige? Alan, Edward, <laughs> Herbert, Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. No, it's a kind of a colour of milky coffee, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we are meteorologically in autumn now, so I thought it's probably a bit bad time, unlike our guests, to, to, <laughs> to, to tone my colouring down a little bit. Anyway, over in Cambridgeshire, smiling delightfully, we have Gordis Maria Sophia Fredrickson. Um, how are you doing? How am I doing? I am super excited for this episode. I've had a couple of sneak peeks of things that are in store, and it's going to be, be quite the planty <laughs> extravaganza. You hinted at our guests' amazing clothing. I actually looked through my wardrobe to see if there was anything that I could wear that would possibly match or, or rival or complement uh, Mike's amazing shirts. There was nothing. There's nothing like it. Mike Clifford <laughs> of Mike's Rare Plants, welcome back to Talking Dirty, a long overdue visit. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> How many of these amazing shirts do you have, Mike? I must, must have about... I've currently got about 20, I think. Oh. I, do, I do get a bit bored with them every now and again and take them up the charity shop. So uh, <laughs> you can see people walking around in my shirts around Broadstone where I live. <laughs> I think it's great to be distinctive. I think it's great to be yeah. famous for something. We'd be really disappointed if you turned up in, what was it, Cafe Ole or something, what yeah. Alan is wearing today. <laughs> so. Anyway, we're really, we're really here to talk about the plants. And lots of people have been able to enjoy your garden recently because you've opened a couple of times for charity and been extremely popular. Yes, yeah, it's been very, very well attended. We had uh, 200 and, I think we had 230 people on Saturday in a very small garden in four hours. So uh, a few less on Sunday, but Saturday's always the busiest day. So I have my plants there out the front as well, where people come from all over the country just to buy a few rare plants and support the charity. So and Tina, Tina just just makes loads of cakes. She did 30 cakes for the first weekend, 43 cakes for the second weekend. And they all well went. Done. Oh, they love her. <laughs> oh, I wish I'd been there. Plants and cakes. Oh, it sounds amazing. Also, I don't know if it's because of your openings, but you did um, end up on, I think, the front page of the Mail Online. <laughs> as I, well. I did. I did, unfortunately, yes. And slightly misrepresented by the Mail Online. <laughs> Uh, they, they, I had an interview that we have a local news company that will do stories and they'll sell them to the local press and they said Mike you're up for a lot we've got I'm a celebrity on the telly if you put a pith hat on can we take some photo of you in your jungle sort of uh, Livingston I presume and, and we'll try and sell it to some papers and they, they did the, the photographs all great and then at the end of the interview uh, the, the gentleman asked what happens if you get a, a water shortage I said, well, actually, here in Dorset, we probably won't because we rely on underground springs, so we haven't got a hose pipe there. But if we did, I've got this big water butt, and I buried it in the ground two foot so it didn't stick above the fence. And I told him that. And I said, I've got a submersible pump in there, and I, I use it to water my nepenthes and my rare ferns, just that greenhouse, they like rainwater. And that was it. And then two days later, I had people coming into my office at work saying, have you seen your own... Um, on, in the uh, mail online and you're a water hog and you've got thousands of litres of water stored under your garden. I said, have I? <laughs> 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 I did phone them up and they did apologise to me and the actual Daily Mail uh, sent uh, a lady down from London and she did a, a lovely uh, interview with me which we had a two-page spread in the actual Daily Mail which was quite nice but the sun had me as a, a water hog so I had all these emails sent through. I had guys in the shop floor where I work coming up with their empty water bottles saying, Mike, can I have some water, please? <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of made out you had this storage unit underneath loads of your garden, like you just had yeah. a massive tank submerged. 
<laughs> Absolutely. We did have a couple of people on the open day saying, and where do you store your water? I said, in that little water bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say that, you know, jokingly. Um, it's, it is true in this house, there is a water storage tank underneath the orangery. And I mean, it is, it's about 14 feet by eight feet by probably eight feet deep. And it collects all the rainwater from the top of the, you know, from the roof. Wow. Um, and originally that rainwater was used for washing, washing clothes and washing bodies. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I said, I'm yeah. phoning the mailer. <laughs> <laughs> we found the real water hog. <laughs> but seriously, seriously, I mean, if we're going to have this kind of climate that we've had this summer, I think it'd be a, a, a very good thing if more people did have a bit of water storage in their garden Absolutely. under their house. No, absolutely. No, I totally agree. And our local council en encourages it. They actually sell water butts cheap for a fiver every year and uh, and compost bins, and they encourage you to, to save yeah. water. Yeah. But some of the comments were terrible. But, but hey, we'll, get, we'll <laughs> go over that. That's, <laughs> that's fine. It was all good, good humoured in the end, which is good. I'm getting so itchy looking at the <laughs> glance behind Mike. I wanted to start talking about it. I, mean, I know. It's... If you're if you're listening to the audio version, as you might expect, Mike is basically sitting in a jungle, and some of the leaves we can see over his shoulder are extremely enticing. Before we get onto that, just quickly, I mean, talking about water storage and stuff, how has this awful dry summer been in your garden, and have you had an okay amount of rain in Dorset? Uh, we haven't had hardly any rain at all, but we do rely on underground springs, so we haven't got a hose pipe down. So I do hose pipe every. I don't hose pipe very much because we're we're on heavy clay, and about two foot down, I've got a foot of grey clay, and under that's water. So if I dig down three foot, the water comes up, and we've got local springs around as well. So that the, the garden doesn't need a lot of water, just the pots and the, the front garden tin of waters. But um, hardly we don't hardly water much. The problem I've had is the big leaves I'll grow, I'll come home at night and it's it's like a Dracula movie where you hit the sunlight. They're just dust, they just crumble in your fingers, the leaves, which has been a shame because a lot of them are cloud forest plants. They hate the heat, they like the cool shade and I've got very little shade in my garden. So that's been the biggest issue for me this year, which is, this hey, it's, that's, that's what it is, that's what gardening is. <laughs> And you say you only water containers, but I always get the impression with all of your special things that you have in pots, you must have quite a lot of things that are in containers. There's, there's a fair few in containers and a lot of most most of the because uh, I'm, I'm limited for space. Our garden's only 60 by 30. Some of the uh, the less hardy stuff, I plunge plant in the garden each, each summer. So just dig a hole, stick them in. Absolutely fine. Put a bit of mulch over the top. Always mulch the garden because... Like I said to the, the male, there's, there's plenty of ways of, uh, of keeping the moisture in. I always put a big layer of bark over my garden. You can't see it because the plants just grow up and it's, it's a jungle. But it, when, you, when you do water, or if there is any rain, it, it holds it in so it doesn't evaporate straight out of the soil. So there's, there's, there's ways and means. All right, I'm going to let Alan have his way. I think we should talk about your plants. Uh, where <laughs> would you like to start with show and tell? Ooh. Well, do you know, I'm, I'm going to start with not one of the big leaf plants, but one of the smaller plants. So on our open day, we had a, we had a gentleman uh, come around. He used to, he's XQ trained. And he said, you've got some amazing plants, Mike. Where do you get them all from? And I said, well, a lot of them I grow from, from seed. And I was in my greenhouse at the time. And there's a plant that I grew three years ago from seed. And I, I reached around to get it. I said, I grew this from seed three years ago. And I'm waiting for it to flower. And I'll do exactly the same now because it's flowering today, which is amazing. Uh -huh for this to flower and it's oh my god it's flowered <laughs> and if he hadn't have said where did i grow my seeds this would have been hidden behind in my greenhouse because it's full in there and i wouldn't have seen this just amazing flower and it's a mauritius blue red nectared flower and it drips blood basically it drips red nectar it was the first oh. plant in the world to, to be found with red nectar and it has these little these little droplets of nectar that come out and they're, they're they're pollinated, they're, it's eaten by geckos. They pollinate the plant. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's not dripping its red nectar this morning, but this flower actually opened up this morning, especially for us. <laughs> so, uh, it, it will as it gets bigger. This is three years from seed. As it gets bigger, it'll just be full of flowers all summer. That's then, amazing. I showed a picture to the other half, who everyone knows isn't massively into gardening, and he yeah. said, Mike's flower is bleeding. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it looks like that. It's very sweet as well. 
So hence the little geckos will stick their tongues up inside. I don't think my tongue is long enough to get up inside. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know quite how I'm going to pollinate it yet. <laughs> it's got a nice fine foliage as well, so it's not just something yeah. to grow for those lovely bell-like yeah. flowers. It's a bit like uh, Lobelia laxiflora sort of foliage. It's, yes. Uh, yeah. lovely, lovely foliage. Ah, right. So, Nescodon Mauritius, from the Campanulancy family from Mauritius. Yeah, it, it has got that lovely bell thing going on. A lovely blue as well, and the blue and red in combination are... Oh. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. Show stopping together. Absolutely. So was that easy to grow from seed or was that one of these things where you had to try a billion different methods and take notes? No, it was quite, quite simple. It was just surface sown and um, in the propagator. And I think I had two, two plants come up out of 10 seeds. So it's not too bad. And th those are the two plants in the same pot. Uh, I'm going to try to take some cuttings because I always find it easier to take cuttings. Yeah, me too. <laughs> are so much easier. Um, than, than, uh... You know, I want to ask you something, Mike, because you, you're really good because you don't have a huge amount of space. You're great mm. at maximising that space and being really efficient. And I've heard you say before that you'll um, strike things in water. What is yeah. your key to transitioning them from water into soil? Right. So from water, I've progressed. So often so certain things are easy, like um, begonia luxuriance. Mine's, mine's absolute. I couldn't even get it under the carport. It, it was at least 14 foot tall this year. I had to cut two foot off the top to move it because uh, the flowers were hanging down. It was pulling the plant down. So I cut two foot off the top of my begonia luxuriance. Those cuttings are really easy in water. And I show people on, on my Instagram pages and Twitter pages how to do it because they, they will only root from the node. So when people cut the cutting, if they cut the stem and put the stem in water, it won't root. So you need to have the node in the water and it'll root in two weeks. Lovely roots in it. They're fine. Other plants I've now progressed on because I had that problem where you, where you take the roots out of water, put them in a pot, they droop, die. So I've changed my method quite a lot. And I'll, I'll actually show you. So this is, I'll show you one of my, my, my new plants. So this is an unknown plant. It's an unknown strawberry land piece. We don't know, we, we know where it's from. It's from, it was collected in Yunnan by a French botanist called Jackie Pousset. Um, not sure what it is. Nobody knows what it is. We think it's a strobilanthus. It had, it's got these enormous big leaves and it goes about two meters tall and has purple flowers. Um, I, I actually thought it was something else. I thought it was, um, well, it was one of these. I thought it was a, I've got one here. A brilliantasia because it's got a very similar brilliantasia leaf uh, stem but uh, the leaves are just massive so that very easy from cuttings and i'll show you what i do with the cuttings this is what i now do with most of my cuttings so it's chopped top sphagnum moss and perlite on the propagator when that roots the roots entangle around the perlite and the sphagnum moss and when i take it out the roots aren't bare so i pop the sphagnum moss and the perlite around the roots in it and I get virtually 100% germination, germination now. I don't get any drooping of the leaves. And, it's such, and, and I use little clear cups, pinpricks in the bottom, just pinpricks, um, fields, and that they root in about two weeks. And you can see, you can also see all the roots. And when it's fully rooted, I put the whole lot with the perlite and whatever the roots are holding on to goes into the pot. So it stops that stress. So much better on actually telling this is my way of doing it now that's brilliant that um is reminiscent of um something jane perone does the house plant uh, expert right. who yes. but, yeah. but in a much smaller scale way because you'll basically have you know a, a tupperware with lots and lots of moist perlite in and put cuttings in there to root into the perlite um yeah. and i and i suppose if you haven't got a propagator yeah. maybe that sort of small scale way of doing little bits of, of plants obviously it won't work for something yeah. as big as that um, but that's brilliant i'm gonna have to try that because I, apart from as you mentioned a few plants which is so easy that they'll transition straight from water into soil i do yes. lose lots of things by yeah. by trying that method thank you yeah. so that brings you on to so an unknown strobilanthus. Don't know what it is. I've taken a taken a small plants to Wisley yesterday um, for Matthew. Um, and they're going to try and find out what it is. I've given quite a few cuttings away because I want to try and get it back into cultivation because um, 
it was it was lost again and my friend had this for two years he didn't know what it was gave me a small cutting this has just grown he came around last night actually he said wow is that the plant <laughs> it's bigger than the one i've got so, <laughs> it gets, gets huge but in front of it here is is a is another strawberry land piece and this one is the grossy pinus strawberry land is grossy pinus and it's i don't know if you can see that it's got the most beautiful leaves they look very hairy they are they are covered in fine white hairs and it's just stunning and underneath is, is almost this, this yellow color so it's a beautiful plant and this came i was given a lucky enough to be given three small cuttings um from christopher who runs the uh, glass house at wisley when i donated some plants a few years ago and he said to me yesterday he said, how's that strawberry lanthus doing? I said, it's absolutely brilliant. I said, it's, it's almost as nice as the one they had in their glass house, which they've now planted out, which is massive. But they, they started off with one like this. And it, it's, it, it does flower, uh, but the flowers are quite insignificant. And after it flowers, it dies. So you've got to take the cuttings, the side shoot cuttings. So it, it flowers after about three years. And this one's two years now, so it'll probably flower next year. I've just, just taken a couple of side shoot cuttings. Uh, so hopefully get that too. And again, I'd like to try and share this around because it's just such a stunning, stunning plant, not in cultivation. No, you never see it anywhere. So that's 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 a lovely strawberry lanthus. And another one, a, a, another strawberry lanthus, which um, uh, I have to I have to mention Philip because he mentioned me three times in this podcast from Philip Oostenbrink, <laughs> uh, who, who brought me this absolutely beautiful strawberry lanthus, this variegated form with a little white. Uh, markings on uh lactia strawberry lanthus lactia again very easy from cuttings so, so it, that one i do root in water on the windowsill um i just take loads of cuttings and they root up and this is this is one of the cuttings i took earlier in the year so a beautiful that, i put that out as summer bedding as well it's, it's, yeah i was gonna say that that, that would look of great uh, use as summer bedding yeah yeah it's, it's beautiful as summer bed it gets 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 a big clump as well it gets quite big so I'm, I'm really pleased with that. I love that piece. <laughs> that is totally strokeable, that silvery it's, strawberry land piece. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's almost like material. It's, it's a beautiful plant. When I first saw it, I lost it after it for two years before I plucked up enough courage to ask Christopher for a cutting. <laughs> for a cutting of one of them. Right, so mentioned Philip again. So me and Philip and, uh, and, and another gentleman, we did an order from America from Plant Delights. Pharaoh's mask. Oh, my gosh. Another one I've lusted after for years. This thing is, this thing is just absolutely amazing. That is incredible. It's it is supposed to curve, at least do curve back. That's how it's supposed to be. And each time a new leaf comes out, it comes out even more ribbed with these beautiful ribs. And it throws out stulons at the bottom like there's no tomorrow. This one's got five on it at the moment. And uh, you can see they, they, they root up. They root up. Really quickly, and you so still get. So, what's this full name again? It's Colocasia escalenta Pharaoh's mask. So it's a it's a high, it's an American hybrid. It's not in, it's, it's in cultivation. You're only supposed to buy them from this company in America, who who sort of have it have it uh, marked. But isn't that fantastic? Absolutely astonishing. It's been the showstopper in the corner of the video, oh. the backdrop, just taking <laughs> over half of the screen with these <laughs> monumental ribbed leaves. And yeah. I suppose because of the ribbing, they catch the light in these sort of oh. lovely stripes. So from a distance, yeah. it almost looks like it's got vaguely silvery stripes on it. It's, it's just wonderful. The stems it's, look lovely as well. Oh, they are. It's be beautiful, uh, beautiful Colocasia. And uh, yeah, so it's, it was a showstopper at the open weekend as well, everybody. I kept it in my bottom greenhouse out of the way so people wouldn't touch it and, uh, and sort of start stroking it and feeling it. And I thought, no, I'll, I'll put it in the green. <laughs> what, what is the key to, to growing colocasia as well, would you yeah. say? So all colocasia, colocasia, basic colocasia is a, a food crop. So if you want big tubers, you put them in the open ground. If you want big leaves, put them in small pots. So I plunge plant my collocation. So that, that will stay in that pot. It's not getting any bigger. That will stay in that pot till it's massive. Um, if you put them in a big pot, they just produce big tubers and small leaves. So if you keep them in small pots, they produce massive leaves and small tubers. So I plunge plant my collocations and allocations in the garden each year. I don't plant them out because you just end up with massive tubers. 
and you just want the leaves. We we don't eat. I don't eat edos and taro, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so that's that's the that's the key to them. And the other key is feed. I virtually feed this with high nitrogen feed. I use a Kempak high nitrogen or um, tomato feed or seaweed feed. Virtually every feed. And it's even that's sat in a that's actually sat in water, so sat in a truck in uh -huh. water, and that's got uh, that's got feed in the water. So even the water's got feed in it, and, and they'll just, and that's gone absolutely, when we got it from Plant Delights, they weren't in the best of conditions, all of our plants, they were, they were pretty poor. Did um, you have trouble getting, th getting through the customs, Matt, uh, Mike? With the, the... Philip organised it all, did all the customs, but yeah, it was quite expensive. They kept it in customs for quite some time, and, the, and unfortunately the plants weren't in good condition. That's the thing I'm always worried about buying from America is the fact that the customs on our side, it's our are, side, they hold things up. Yeah, that's that's what happened with ours. Yeah, they, were, yeah. they, were, they were the best of the plants. But uh, hey, looks fantastic now. It does. <laughs> you saved well it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I also got the the. Uh, what, did, what did Philip have the with the yellow stripes on? But mine's got no yellow, so it's the. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm really, really disappointed. I saw Phillips on here the other day and I thought, mine doesn't look like that. <laughs> but Pharaoh's mask probably looks better. <laughs> <laughs> Alan's now trying to look through his notes. Mine yeah. was on the computer, so I can't, I can't look. Okay, the problem yeah. is, if Alan looks through his notes, he has to um, then interpret his writing. Was it uh, <laughs> Santa Disha African Bold? That's the one. Yeah, yeah. mine's Santa Disha with no gold. Oh. <laughs> 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 I've got three of them. <laughs> they all look healthy and lovely. No variegation on the leaf so far. Oh. I think I've got a dud. <laughs> <laughs> which is a shame because that was a real showstopper on Philip's podcast, which we will link to on the YouTube version if you want to go back and watch it. There were lots of lots of variegated plants, as you would expect, yeah. and lots of really, really interesting plants. I mean, it has proven we were talking about this with jimmy blake as he took a tour around alan's garden how frustrating it is sometimes when you see nurseries abroad and there are so i mean particularly for you when you're always after something new something interesting and there's so much breeding work that goes on particularly in places like america it must just be tantalizing sometimes the things you can't get your hands on yeah it's a, it's a shame but hey there's always seeds so yeah uh, always always try and grow grow something unusual from seed and obviously you, you grow all these interesting things from seed and you probably have a myriad sources that you get the seed from. Are they mostly, are they kind of friends with good connections? <laughs> Where do you say, find your interesting seed? I would probably say friends with good connections is, is where I get a lot of my rarer plants from, the rarer seeds. And I'll, I'll send them stuff as well. The thing, the thing with, with my plants is I grow lots of plants from seed every year. The really rare stuff I share with plantsmen. I don't sell them. I give them and trade and we swap. And uh, I had a gentleman round last night, and uh, it's fantastic. He always brings me around something new that I've, I've not seen before or heard of before. And uh, we, we trade plants, and I gave I gave him a little piece of the Pharaoh's mask to take home, and uh, some other, and a, and a boot full of other plants. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, mainly mainly friends and sharing. And this is what we do. It's like on here, we see something we like, and we'll send send plants out, and hopefully keep them going. I like this is where I have to say thank you to you to you, Mike, for. But my, um, I can't remember what it's called now. Basque and Sally or Mountain Papaya? Mountain Papaya. Yeah. Because I have papayas on one of them now. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I've got green flowers up the stem and stuff like that. But I, And they're now probably taller than I am. So they're, they're going to be six foot plus, two meters plus, wow. I think. That's, that's brilliant. Wow, that's brilliant. Because they're only a couple of foot high on a something. Yeah, that's, but that's... and they're planted in, in, in the ground in, the, in our big uh, pelly house. And they're, oh, right. they're really doing well. But will they? Will the papayas actually ripen in this country? They, they, they do ripen, yeah. They turn, they turn yellow. They're more used for jam and chutneys rather than... They're not eaters. But they're quite... <laughs> they, have the, the, they draw you <laughs> up to your elbows. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a few down the garden, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Have you sniffed the flowers, either of you? Because no. I haven't, but Jimmy did, and he said he thought they smelled of mushrooms. All right, okay. All right. okay. <laughs> Which I wasn't no, expecting. I haven't, no. <laughs> no. So there's, a, there's a job for after the podcast, Alan. Go and sniff yeah. the flowers <laughs> and see if they do st indeed smell of mushrooms or if that was yeah. just Jimmy's nose. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll grab another one. Right, so I'm going to actually turn my seat round now because this is 
This is another one I grew from seed this year. This was the other showstopper, Worklia ferox, hibiscus family. Absolute beast, this one. This one has grown to me. So this was seed grown. I grew three, three from seed. I sent two, two plants down to the Eden Project because they were after it. They messaged me online and said, could, could we possibly uh, get a seedling off you? So I took them down. I grew three, kept one myself. And this is it. It grows to about two meters tall, has uh, bright yellow flowers on it, has these red, beautiful red uh, stems. The stems do turn red and the uh, veins turn red. But it's very spiky, very prickly. Uh, absolute stunner. And if you're uh, listening and you think spiky and prickly is just the stems, the entire leaf just absolutely, looks absolutely, absolutely covered in prickles. It is. It's, it's, look at it. It's an absolute beauty. So that, that was also not, not to mess with. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing, the thing I found which I was really pleased about, I said about my propagation methods. So two weeks ago, I took some side cuttings off. They've rooted. So hey. I know um, have babies. So uh, without having to grow them from seed, so they'll grow considerably quicker. So that was an experiment. I've not tried this before with uh, with the uh, work there. Your method for doing these cuttings, so we've mentioned the sphagnum moss and the perlite, but you actually have them in little see-through sort of reusable plastic cups. Yes, that's, that's all they are, just plastic cups. And I put pinpricks just around the bottom and in the base, just pinpricks, just to let the moisture out. With the sphagnum moss and the perlite, keeps it moist, and then you can see all the roots. So it works really well. Actually, that's a pretty brilliant idea because, you know, that because of the root interaction, sphagnum moss and the perlite, as you say, they almost hold hold the roots together like a ball. Yes. And so you're yeah. not disturbing those roots when you when you pot it. Yeah. I mean, pot it gently, yeah. and then they just go out into the compost. That's it. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's why I find works so much better now. That I don't get that drooping and uh, that makes utter well, sense, Mark. Why haven't yeah. you thought of it before? Yeah, you're a genius. <laughs> and then you can actually see what's going on because you've used the plastic cup. So yeah. that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, some of them are amazing. Some of the root colours as well. Some of the bright red roots and bright yellow roots. And uh, the, the roots themselves, I go, well, sometimes I don't want to pot it up. I just like seeing the roots. <laughs> <laughs> Little art installation. <laughs> so, yeah, I took, um, I took two of these down to RHS Wisley yesterday as well. Uh, so that, so that, they, they should be able to grow up two, two, three metres tall, actually. They can get it to flower. Yes. Really? They are quite hard to overwinter. They, they are a, a tropical hibiscus and they do need heat over winter, heat and moisture over winter. So I'll keep the cuttings will stay in the propagator and they'll be next year's plant. So this was seed grown. So this is, uh, they do grow very quickly. Do you ever have, you know, a moment of mourning when it gets to the point where you realise the temperatures are dropping and something like that, you haven't really got the place to put it and you're going to have to rely on the cuttings and you can't see it through, you know, like somewhere like um, Wisley or East Ruston could, or are you just really pragmatic about it? I, I'm, I'm quite pragmatic about it. I, don't, I, don't, I give a lot of plants to botanical gardens. Wisley, um, I give some to Birmingham Botanical Gardens at the open day, um, some Masanga and Cacropria that uh, I talked about last time. And I went to Wisley yesterday to see the Cacropias that I gave them. They must be 10 foot tall now, oh. fingered, fingered leaves. And uh, this, this, year's, this year's seedlings, um, well, that's, that's my Cacropria seedling uh, from this year. And uh, this is the Masanga. And they, the leaves are really plain when you, when you first grow them. But then they suddenly split into this multi-fingered, beautiful tropical tree that grows about 80 foot tall. Wisley's is looking stunning. So uh, I, was, I was really, really pleased and proud to see it there yesterday because it's, it's, it's like an extension of my own greenhouse. If I can donate it, <laughs> go down and see it well, thrown fantastically down there. So they, uh, and I, I, I gave one to Abbotsbury, a, a Cacropria, and they got it out in their tea rooms. And it's, it's, Beautiful, it's stunning. Huge, big fingered leaves on it, and theirs must be about eight, ten foot tall in their in their in their tea room area. It's a great way of looking at it. It's like your extended garden all over the country, greenhouses yeah. and growing yeah. spaces up and down the land. That's that's right. Yeah, I took it. So the, I I I, math, I messaged Matthew and said I had some uh, some more more plants for him. Could I drop them down? And I had uh, I grew some balsa trees for. Uh, for the Eden project, because they 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 are they messaged me and said, 
could they possibly have some balsa trees? So uh, I, I sent them down half a dozen of those. And I had three left, so I took them to Wisley yesterday as well. So they're a massive tree. They're, they're, far, they're a bit like a polonia, and they grow, grow very fast. But the leaves are like, they're like fabric. They're fantastic, the leaves of a, a balsa tree. I've, I've never grown it from seed before. And uh, I saw the, the Attenborough's, uh, the Green Planet, yeah. episode one. And it shows these beautiful balsa trees. When, the, when a tree falls down, the balsa seedlings suddenly grow up. And those balsa seedlings came from, uh, from the Eden Project that they used to film. And, of course, they gave them all their plants. They didn't have any. So I, I kindly sort of sent them down some of mine <laughs> to replace the ones they've given to the Green Planet. So that's, that was a nice thing to do. I love that. So a couple of steps of separation from the Green Planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It could have been mine <laughs> if I've got <laughs> <laughs> good morning hello how are you i'm fine thank you i've got all these hairs sticking up i keep seeing them again you can't see them we can't see them no of course you're fine. my hair is in rebellion <laughs> <Try to. laughs> how many of these shirts do you have mike oh um, sorry <laughs> door typical typical <laughs> it's not even a parcel oh, for me good. It's a parcel for the paper. Outrageous. <laughs> How many of these shirts do you have, Mike? Oh, no. And now Mike's frozen. <laughs> Let's tr take three. Oh, my internet. It's, it's, it's actually stuck. This is going to be annoying. You have stuck again. Do you just need to move oh. it again? Right, well, the good news what? is, every time you froze, you looked so happy. Like, you just froze in this, like, super cheerful expression. I always freeze looking really daft, so kudos <laughs> to you. That was impressive. Oh, well, brilliant. take four. Let's me, let me try and ask about your shirt collection before we get into the plants. Hey! 